just like I know what I'm doing. Okay. Um, so yeah, so sorry for the delay. <laughs> So um, we've got two modules in together here, uh, CMO604 uh, and System Specification and Design, and KF6009 uh, Model Based Design and Verification. Uh, don't worry about the change in titles. I've been teaching the same kind of stuff for donkey's years, and the titles change from time to time. But you get to hear what I know, and uh, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, it, it's as up to date um, as I get. Um, the stuff that we'll be looking at is uh, is relevant uh, right now. There's a there's an article in this month's communications of the ACM, which is one of the, the, the premier computing journals, um, talking about exactly the kind of stuff that we're going to be looking at. So don't be put off by the title or the, or the change in module code. Um, it's uh, all uh, good, relevant stuff. Uh, having said that, I have got um, separate separate websites. So, uh, if you're signed up for uh, for KF six double zero nine, you'll see this one. Uh, and if you're um, signed up for uh, CMO six zero four. Uh, you see, uh, you see this one. Uh, apart from the apart from the titles and the links on the pages, there's going to be no significant difference to the content. So, uh, so you can uh, use which uh, whichever site is relevant uh, to you. But um, as far as the uh, as far as the content is concerned, it's going, be, it's going to be identical. And as far as the assessment is concerned, it's going to be identical as well. Um, I'm going to give you a, 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 a bit of an introduction to the module uh, today. We'll um, we'll get into some uh, serious stuff uh, quite er quite early on, um, and hopefully by the end of uh, this lecture, you'll have a good idea of the kind of uh, work you're going to be doing, at least for the for the first six or seven weeks. Um, if we uh, if we just briefly look at um, the uh, the teaching plan here, you'll see what's coming up. So what we're going to do um, for the first seven weeks. Uh, is some work using a, a language called TLA+. If, uh, if some of you have been out on placement and you've been talking to your uh, friends who, uh, who didn't do a placement and came through last year, uh, you might well uh, have talked to them about uh, something called Promella and Spin. Um, we've, uh, we've changed that this year. We're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do TLA+, instead of Promella and Spin. Uh, the, the point of, of TLA plus is, um, is essentially the same as, as Promella and Spin, but I'm hoping that the language is going to be a little bit more approachable. Um, so that's why we're, we're making that change. So that means that essentially I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of rewriting uh, the first six or seven weeks worth of, of material. Uh, the other change that we've made is we've, we've compressed the work on probabilistic modeling a little bit. So um, recently, Michael Brockway has been teaching four weeks of probabilistic modeling at the, at the end of the module. Um, and Michael retired at the end of uh, the, the, the last academic year. Uh, and we're going to uh, compress that, so that work now and just do a week's worth of that, which means that you, we get a little bit more time uh, here to <coughs> deal with the, uh, with the TLA plus stuff. And I'm hoping that that means that um, you won't, you won't feel quite as, as rushed as I think maybe students have felt in the past. 
Uh, so we'll uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, uh, I'm, I've been enjoying working with TLA Plus over the summer. Uh, it's a nice language. Um, I hope you're going to agree. We'll see. We'll see how we get. Uh, we'll see how we get on. Um, we are uh, starting in week uh, eight. Still going to pick up some stuff using Upal. Uh, which is a, a real-time modeling tool, so, we, so you'll, you'll still get some, uh, some experience with, uh, with modeling of real-time systems. Uh, and that's going to be essentially the, the, the same material as, we, uh, as, as we've covered for the last um, yeah, five, yeah, five, five to ten years or so. Um, and then just one, one week, we'll just give you a flavor of some probabilistic modeling in the, in, in, in the last week. Okay, so um, the module is about uh, approaches to modeling and designing and verifying um, embedded systems primarily, but uh, the techniques that we will look at um, are applicable to all kinds of, uh, of different systems. Um, so the first question I guess we, uh, we want to ask is, is why, why do we care about uh, some better approaches to, uh, to specification and design? Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, I'll talk to you a bit about why embedded systems provide a, uh, an interesting um, problem area for study. So our main focus will be, will be on embedded systems, but for actually for the first couple of weeks, we'll look at modeling uh, data rather than control. Uh, and then we'll move on to, uh, to, to uh, more control-oriented systems. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll clarify exactly what we mean by specification, uh, design, and verification. Uh, then we're going to have a, a recap of some, uh, some basic maths. You might remember uh, from CSF in the first year, you did some, some simple discrete maths using, using logic and, uh, and sets. Uh, we'll just have a, a very quick recap of that uh, in case uh, you're, uh, you, you've let that slip. And then I'm hoping that we'll get on to looking at our first formal specification uh, towards, the, uh, towards the end of the lecture. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with what topics are covered, uh, how the modules are set, and so on. So anybody got any questions about any of that? Yeah, so that's the, that's the plan for the rest of the session. Um, so I guess a motivation for looking for better methods for specification and design uh, might come from the, the failures of, of previous approaches to specification and design. So um, I've given you a, a list here of, of some pretty well-known uh, software and hardware failures. Uh, some of them go back quite a long way. Uh, so the Intel Pentium floating point division bug uh, is from 1994. Um, that cost uh, Intel an estimated half a billion dollars. Uh, and that was uh, probably the, uh, the starting point for Intel taking a, a serious interest in, in formal approaches to, uh, to hardware specification and design. Uh, the Theorac 25 radiotherapy machine is from about the same kind of uh, era. Um, that was a, a, a problem in, in which uh, a radiotherapy machine gave uh, massive overdoses of, of radiotherapy to some uh, cancer patients, uh, some of whom died. Uh, the London Ambulance Service uh, computer aided dispatch system uh, meant that uh, ambulances didn't get to, uh, to people who needed them uh, on time. Uh, Ariane 5 was a, a European Space Agency um, <coughs> uh, rocket uh, which, uh, which blew up 43 seconds after takeoff um, because of a software fault. Uh, Toyota unintended acceleration, some, uh, some high-end uh, high Toyota vehicles. Uh, would suddenly start accelerating um, without, uh, without the driver intending it. Again, 
software, uh, a, a, a combination of software and hardware faults. Uh, airbags fail, fail to deploy in, in some uh, Nissan vehicles. Uh, so these, uh, these, uh, uh, this is a much more recent one. The Nissan airbag deployment failure is, uh, is uh, from about 2008 or so. And then you'll have heard of Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, they, they've been uh, uh, recent problems, hard, essentially hardware design problems, uh, affecting uh, pretty much all Intel and ARM uh, microprocessors. And then right up to date this year, TSB had been in the news a lot recently uh, with their computer, computer systems failing to uh, deal with account migration properly. So the, the, the consequences of, of, of these sorts of failures are people might die, um, companies might lose billions of pounds, and certainly the reputation of companies is, uh, is seriously affected when, when, when things fail. So this is the kind of motivation that we have for, for looking at uh, better approaches. Um, I wouldn't like to say that uh, all of these examples are attributable only to uh, specification and design problems. Um, you know, probably one of the lessons that, 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 that we learn uh, from looking at these, at these failures is that there are almost always a combination of factors. Uh, so um, they're often system failures, not just software. So maybe a combination, say, of how the hardware and the software interact. So, for example, the Nissan airbag deployment problem is a, a combination of uh, the, the, the sensors in the, in, in the passenger seat uh, and the way in which the software calibrated those sensors, so, so failing to detect the fact that a passenger was sitting in the, uh, in, in, in the passenger seat and therefore not deploying the airbag in, in an accident situation. So they're often, uh, they're often a combination of, of, of hardware and software. They're often uh, either um, instigated or, or made worse by poor project management. Um, but point number three is the one that we're, we're focusing on. That there's, there's often uh, evidence of poor specification design and verification techniques in, in those projects. Um, the, uh, the Toyota um, uh, unintended acceleration uh, failure. Uh, it also showed poor implementation practices. Uh, so there's a, there's a chap called Michael Barr who did a, a huge report uh, on uh, poor implementation uh, in, in, in the software. He was given access to a, a, a lot of the code uh, and came up with uh, all sorts of examples of, of uh, poor, poor coding. Uh, and then uh, Theorect 25 showed uh, evidence of, uh, of in inadequate testing. So. There are a whole variety of, uh, of, of causes of failure and lessons to be learned. Uh, but the one that we're taking for, for this module is, is the issues to do with specification design and verification. Uh, don't feel free to chip in at any time if you've got questions or you want to make a point uh, or you've got something to add to what I say. Uh, just uh, just get, get stuck in. Um, so uh, why, why do we want to study embedded systems? Well, first of all, what, what do we mean by uh, an embedded system? Well, this is my, my definition. It's a computing system embedded in a physical environment uh, for the purpose of monitoring and or control. So we've got some physical environment. We want to capture some, some uh, information about it. Maybe we we'll want to find out what the temperature is, or what the air pressure is, or, 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 or something of that sort. Or, but also, we might want to control the environment. So, if we've got a if we've got a, a chemical plant and we're we're brewing some chemical by by heating it up, not only do we want to know what the temperature of the chemical is, but we want to be able to control the the, the heat source as well. So, monitoring and control of a physical environment. Um, there, are, there are more modern titles now, uh, so you often see people talk about cyber-physical systems. So the cyber emphasizing the, co the computer element, uh, and the physical emphasizing the, uh, the, the, the physical element. Uh, but also Internet of Things is now uh, 
has been for, for five to ten years uh, a hot topic. Uh, and essentially that means uh, sticking an embedded system on the internet. Uh, I still find the, uh, the embedded system end of that the more interesting part, uh, but um, there, is, there are also issues to do with, with uh, allowing your embedded system to communicate over the internet. Uh, and, uh, we'll have a look at some of that uh, if, uh, if any of you are doing the, uh, the distributed real-time systems module. Uh, we'll look at uh, some Internet of Things development in, uh, in semester two of that, of that module. That's uh, 6.05 for, 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 for you guys, uh, embedded systems engineering, which again we're, we're teaching today. So this is, this is my, my view of, uh, of, of what an embedded system might look like. Um, there are two distinct parts to it. Uh, if, we, if we take the term cyber physical, then this is the cyber part, this is the controller. Uh, cyber comes from a Greek word, Kubernetes, which was uh, uh, Greek for a helmsman. So the helmsman is controlling the, uh, is controlling the ship. So, so this, is the, this is the controller. This is a nice regular shape. Uh, it's a discrete system. Uh, the idea here is, uh, is that in, in the general case, the controller might consist of multiple computing nodes. Uh, so we might have several processors. It may only be one, but, but very often several. Uh, and um, they're, they're usually connected by some kind of communication mechanism. So that's the, uh, that's the control element. And the, uh, the, the, the cyber element, uh, sorry, that's the cyber element. The physical element is, uh, is represented by this kind of amorphous, irregular red blob. And that suggests that it's much harder for us to know about, about the, the, uh, the, the, the physical side uh, and to uh, uh, predict what's going to happen. As far as the controller is concerned, our job is to be able to predict exactly what it will do. Um, the physical physical side is, uh, is, much, is much trickier to deal with. But the way in which we deal with it is by trying to obtain information about it using some sensors uh, that we put into the physical environment and then try to control it with some actuators. So this is, this is the, the basic model that we've got. Uh, we've got a, a, a potentially distributed real-time control system uh, receiving information from the physical world via sensors and trying to maintain some control of it over it using actuators. Uh, the key characteristics uh, of our embedded system, the thing that, that makes uh, the embedded systems area worth, worth investigating and, and why it provides a good challenge problem for specification and design techniques, uh, I've listed them here. Uh, so, first of all, concurrency. Um, I, even in the case where we've only got a single node here, it's very often going to have multiple tasks running. So, uh, we've got to be able to deal with, uh, with concurrency. In the case where there are multiple nodes communicating with each other, then, then the, con the concurrency is, is clear. That's, that's what we would mean by a, by a distributed system. Uh, Reasoning about concurrent systems is significantly more challenging than, than reasoning about sequential systems. So understanding your concurrent system uh, is, a, uh, is an interesting uh, problem. Uh, usually we've got uh, processes cooperating to perform some specific task, and that cooperation depends on some communication. So the <coughs> communication which is happening uh, using wh whatever uh, mechanism we have uh, is, uh, uh, is going to prov provide us with some, some design challenges uh, uh, as well. The environment places some, some timing constraints uh, on the controller. So um, Whatever, whatever kind of physical environment we've got, normally it requires uh, control at precise uh, time intervals or at precise times. 
uh, I guess a classic example is if you've got a, uh, a car um, which is uh, controlling its brakes uh, via some kind of brake-by-wire system, uh, then from the, from the instant the, uh, the driver puts a foot on the brake pedal to the moment when the, uh, the pads are applied to the, to the disc, that needs to be a, a, a limited uh, period of time. Uh, it's, no, it's no good suddenly having your system do a garbage collection and uh, applying the brakes two or three seconds later. Uh, it needs to happen uh, within a, a matter of milliseconds. Uh, so the environment typically places some timing constraints uh, on, on our control system, uh, and that's uh, that's what what we what we mean by real time. And then finally, the the, the last characteristic which makes these a, a challenging uh, problem area is that usually they're they're resource constrained. So often we don't have as much processing power as we'd like, we don't have as much memory as we'd like, uh, we don't have as much energy as we like, very often we're dealing with battery powered systems and we need to conserve energy. Um, and those resource constraints pose additional challenges over the, uh, over the design problem. Um, when we look at the, uh, the software and systems development uh, process, we can usually split it into some, uh, some compartments. So there's the, the, the requirement specification phase with, a, with a, uh, uh, a physical system involved. We, we need to do some physical system modeling. Maybe we need to do some control law design. Uh, and then uh, we get on to our digital system requirements uh, after that. We're not going to deal with, uh, with, with these elements. That's a different. That's a different course. Um, we, what, what we're going to do is, is to assume that we're given some some requirements about the physical system uh, or about uh, the required control laws, uh, and we'll take our design from from there. Um, our main focus is going to be on on digital system design and verification, uh, and where we're promoting a technique called model-driven design. So the idea here is that before you try uh, building anything, before you start writing code, uh, you first of all construct some models. And, uh, and then once you've got a model, you can start trying to do some verification on the model. So it's, it's, this is the area of focus here. Um, and then the implementation and testing phase uh, that's primarily what, what we deal with in embedded systems engineering and, and distributed real-time systems. So, so this, is the, this is the key focus for, um, uh, for the modules that we're, we're dealing with here. So why, why adopt a, a model-based design process? Well, if you look at almost any other scientific or engineering uh, process, they all have a huge reliance on, on building a model. So nobody would think about building a bridge without, first of all, modeling the, the, the bridge that they're about to build. Uh, nobody would put a, a new wing on an aeroplane without, first of all, building some prototypes, uh, modeling it, first of all, in software, and then eventually doing some wind tunnel testing. Uh, similarly for a jet engine, uh, you wouldn't get an architect putting a, a building up without having some plans. Uh, so it makes, it makes sense if we, uh, if we want to be um, serious designers of, uh, of digital systems, then we need to apply this approach to, to the engineering of digital systems too. So we need a model before we start, before we start writing any C. Um, so our approach is going to be to design by creating models of, and this bit in brackets is quite important, important aspects of uh, the system to, to be developed. So I'm not necessarily advocating that we'll always build a formal model of the complete system, 
but we'll look at the crucial bits such as the system architecture or the synchronization of processes in a concurrent system uh, or the communication protocols in a system where we've got uh, a distributed uh, system with, uh, with components communicating or the real-time aspects of the system if we've got some, some, some real-time problems to solve. So we'll, we'll pick the critical parts, we'll build a formal model, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll reason about the model before we get on to, uh, to implementation and testing. Um, once we've got our model, the key step and one of the reasons why building a formal model is so useful is that we can then do some um, automated analysis uh, to, uh, to, to find problems with the model, so some, so, some bug hunting uh, analysis, but also some, some fully formal verification. So for, for, for parts of the system, we may well be able to demonstrate that our model in all circumstances satisfies the properties that we want. Uh, so this is, this is way beyond what we can achieve with, with traditional testing techniques. Uh, we, can, uh, we can get a, uh, a fully formal verification of all possible behaviours of our model. Uh, and it's worth, it's worth just, just dwelling on that for a moment because that's, it. that's a, a, a massive ad advance. Now I don't want to oversell that because um, for uh, com complex systems, that's still not possible. This is still a, 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 an area of, 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 of current research. Um, but the, uh, the uh, <coughs> advance that we get in terms of, of, of bug finding is, is always uh, significant. So we, uh, we get our model, we do our analysis, and then we iterate. So having, uh, having tested our models, uh, or, uh, using our, our, our software tools, uh, typically we'll find some bugs, so we refine the model to get rid of the bugs. Uh, and uh, we do some further analysis to, to see if we really have got rid of the bugs. And if we find more bugs, we refine the models again, and so on. Eventually we end up with a model which we, we think is reasonable. Uh, it's, it's, we, we get to a point where we think, that's going to serve as a reasonable basis for implementation. Uh, and only then do we start writing some code. If you like, you can call this an agile development of system models. So agile development gets, it still gets quite a lot of uh, attention. It, it's, it's different from the very traditional waterfall-based approach where it used to be the case you would write your requirements documents and then you'd write your design documents and so on. Before. And, and everything would have to be completed at an earlier stage before you do anything in the later stages. That, that's never been a, a really sensible way to, uh, to approach development. Uh, so agile development has, uh, has, has been popular for, for quite a while. Uh, but very often agile development means writing some code early on and then uh, doing some review, uh, maybe doing some, some unit testing when the tests fail, write some more code so the tests don't fail, and then refactor as you go along. Well, this is a, this is a similar sort of approach, but um, we do it with models rather than with the code base. Yeah, so we refine our models, uh, we, do some, uh, uh, we do some automated uh, analysis on them, uh, and we carry on with that process until we get a model that we're satisfied with. Uh, and that will then serve as a much better, uh, more solid foundation for, for future implementation. Uh, so when it comes to modeling digital systems, what, what sort of approaches uh, are, are available to us, and, and, and in particular, what sort of approach are we going to adopt? Um, well, the, the key thing, uh, to any sort of modeling is, uh, is abstraction. So when you build a model, essentially what you're saying you're doing is you're forgetting about some details of, of the actual system. Yeah. Um, so what we have to do is to, is to pick on, on the key details, the important parts of the system that we want to build, to retain those in the model and to lose the irrelevant detail. 
Um, so abstraction is the uh, is the key technique. So we're interested in uh, in, in what, what features of the system can we take away. So abstract essentially means take away. So uh, what features can we take away from its implementation? What features must we keep? And there's a, there's a trade-off here, because the more we take away, uh, the simpler our model becomes, and we would like the simplest possible model, because uh, the simpler it is, the more likely we are to understand it uh, and to be able to reason about it. Um, but the less accurate the representation is likely to become. So it, when, we, when we forget some detail, then there are things about the system that we, 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 we can't know about. Uh, as long as the detail that we, uh, we, we abstract uh, isn't crucial to our, to our uh, development problem, then that's great. So our aim is to come up with the simplest representation that's accurate enough for whatever purpose we're building our model for. Uh, so you can see from this that, that uh, a model is a representation of an abstraction of a system. Yeah, so we, we're quite a long way away from the, from, the, from the real system that we're going to put into the, into, into the world. Um, and you might well say, well, yeah, what's the point of that? But, well, the point is, that even though we've just got a model, the chances are that we would have improved our understanding and the system that we actually put into the world will be a significantly better system than it would have been if we, if we hadn't built a model in the first place. Um, the approach that we're going to, uh, to adopt to, to building models uh, in this module, uh, we've got We've got, we're going to show you essentially three different uh, modeling languages and three different modeling tools, but they're all based on the same basic idea. And the idea that they're based on is a state transition system. So uh, abstract systems are going to be described as, as collections of behaviors. Uh, and each behavior represents some possible execution of the system that we're trying to build. Uh, and all we mean by a behavior is a sequence of states. So we go through a, a sequence of states uh, during our behavior, and each state is just an assignment of values to variables. Uh, so when we're, when we're building our models, we'll think about uh, what are the variables of the system that, that are, are of interest, and then uh, they will represent a state. And then our next question is, how do we get from some given state to the next state? Uh, so it, it sounds as though it couldn't be simpler, really. Um, we've got some terminology here. Uh, an event, uh, also called a step, is the transition from one state to the next state in a behavior. So all, all three of the techniques that we we'll look at essentially adopt that approach. And we're going to uh, represent our state transition systems formally. So our main tools are set theory and logic. Um, we'll use a variety of different languages uh, and analysis techniques and, and tools, software tools, to, uh, to, to build and to reason about our systems. Um, and the methods that we learn are applicable to both the development of hardware and software. So they're useful for, for describing systems, in other words, specifying requirements, uh, because the, the languages that we use are precise. In other words, there's no ambiguity or vagueness. Um, if, you, if, you, if you see a sentence in the language and you, and you understand the language, then no two people could disagree about what it, what it means. Yeah. Very often when you get a set of informal requirements for a piece of software, uh, lots of you, particularly people who have been away on placement, you'll have been on meetings where you have argued the toss over what, what the requirements mean. Yeah. Well, uh, if, you, uh, if you adopt a formal approach, 
uh, that, that just isn't possible uh, because the requirements uh, are specified absolutely precisely. Uh, you'll see that the specifications that we write are concise as well, so there's no, there's no extraneous stuff in there to, uh, to distract from the main point, uh, and they're, uh, they're completely unambiguous. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're useful for, for, for description, they're also useful for analysis. So um, if we want to demonstrate that some pro program function implements its design, we can get some analysis tools that will allow us to do that demonstration, and it, it will be a, a fully formal demonstration. So, so the, uh, the rigor of mathematics helps to develop a convincing argument using calculation. And you might think this is a bad thing, but, but reducing the reliance on human intuition and judgment is actually, in this area, uh, a good idea. That doesn't mean there isn't room for human intuition and judgment in the creative process, there are still going to be a whole variety of different ways to approach the, uh, the solution to a design problem. Uh, but once you get started on the design process, you want to remove your reliance on intuition and judgment as much as possible, because more often than not, you've got it wrong. So countless times I have uh, I thought I've understood a piece of software, uh, only to find out that actually I didn't. So I know from uh, from uh, experience that reliance on, on intuition and judgment is best avoided. Uh, if, you, uh, if you don't remember anything else about the point of a formal method, then, uh, then this is the thing that you, you, you should re remember. The goal that we're after is to be able to say at the end of our development process that the system satisfies its specification. Uh, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Um, and we're going to write that formally because uh, we've, got, uh, we've got three parts to our informal statement here. We've got the system, uh, we've got the specification, and we've got whatever we mean by satisfies. Well, if we take those three parts, we can write it more concisely. Uh, in, a, in a formal way. So here's our system. This is going to be our, our state transition model. Here's our specification, uh, which, which also might be a state transition model, or it, or it might be something else, as we'll see. And then this turnstile symbol represents some formal notion of satisfaction. So again, there's going to be no possible dispute about what we mean by satisfies. It will be it will be determined absolutely formally by whatever this whatever this relationship symbol uh, means. So that's what we're about. We're, we're about being able to say at the end of our development process that the system satisfies uh, its specification. Uh, and we're going to use formal languages for the system model and for the specification. Um, and we're going to have. Um, formal rules of reasoning for this, uh, uh, for this turnstile symbol. So our formal language uh, will have a formal syntax, uh, it will have a formal semantics, and as I say, for, for reasoning about this, we'll have some formal rules of, of, of reasoning. Uh, some people say that uh, formal methods is, is harder than programming, but actually any programming language you have has uh, has these uh, has these aspects to it. Um, it's just that very often uh, the uh, the formal specif specification of the syntax uh, is not is not great. So, for example, uh, actually with with, with C, for, uh, we'll take that as an example. Um, syntactically, it's a it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a mess, but. It is precise. Um, when we write down a string of symbols, thinking it might be some valid C, um, it's possible to have an automated tool which tells us whether it is valid C or not. So that's our compiler. So we, uh, we, we write down something, we, we think it's a C program, we give it to the compiler, the compiler comes back with 527 syntax errors. 
and we think, oh well, yeah, I didn't do a great job there. Um, C also has uh, a, uh, a semantics, but it's not, in all cases, terribly well defined. So if you uh, if you read uh, the C specification, uh, you often come across little sections which say implementation defined. Well, oh, fantastic! So we write a bit of code, uh, but we've got no idea what it's going to do because the implementer of the uh, of, of the hardware and the compiler have got a free choice uh, over its behaviour. Well, we 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 we'd, uh, we'd like to avoid that, and. If we're trying to do some optimization uh, on our programs, uh, the rules for, for reasoning about whether our optimized program has exactly the same behavior as our unoptimized program uh, are, are significantly more complicated than anything you're going to see in this module uh, for um, formal reasoning about, about system models. So, so don't, don't be put off by the fact that we're going to use a little bit of set theory and logic. It's significantly easier than it is to reason about your, your C programs. Um, so, so formal methods, uh, I'm arguing, are a, are a good thing. Uh, they allow us to do stuff that we, uh, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do uh, in, in probably the most straightforward way. So, I guess a question now is what formal method are we going to use? And uh, we've got a huge choice. So here are some uh, what are called model-based formal methods. I mean, actually they're all model-based, but, but these what in, in, in these methods the, the model is explicit. So you'll see some things that you, that you might recognize, some things I've already mentioned. So Promella and Spin, which, we, uh, which we've uh, used in the past, TLA Plus, which we're going to use in this module, and Upol, which we're going to use in this module. Uh, but we've got a, a whole bunch of, uh, of similar, similar methods. So VDM, Z, B and Event, B, Alloy, and Abstract State Machines are all very similar to TLA Plus. So once you've learned how to, uh, to, to, to work with TLA Plus, you'll have a good start for working with these, with these other methods. Uh, PRISM is, uh, is the tool that we're going to look at for probabilistic reasoning uh, right, at the end of the, uh, right at the end of the module. So we've got, so we've got those. Um, there are a bunch of uh, uh, logics that we can use. So there's first order predicate logic. There are modal logics. Uh, Temporal logics of, of various sorts, higher order logics, and so on. And there are also um, algeb algebraic methods, algebras and calculi, so things like MOD and real time MOD, uh, CCS, PI calculus, biograph, CSP, Lotos. There's this whole kind of plethora of, uh, of formal methods. So, a key question that we have is how do we choose where to start? Uh, imagine that you're convinced by my brilliant argument that formal methods are a great thing. Where do you, where do you start learning about it? Well, here are some, uh, here are some criteria. Um, we'd like it to be as simple as possible. We'd like our starting point to be as simple as possible. So some first year, some first year maths, a little bit of logic, a little bit of set theory. This second point is, is key. We'd like to have computer-based tool support. So absolutely the key advantage of working with a formal method is that you can use a software tool to check what you've written. Uh, so we'd like to be able to check that our, 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 our specifications are syntactically correct. We'd like to be able to check semantic relationships. We'd like to be able to find problems with our, uh, with our models. Uh, we'd like to be able to simulate our models uh, and we'd like all of this to be applicable to industrial scale systems. So we'd like some evidence of industrial use for our method. And finally, we'd like a good return on, on our investment. So there's an effort involved in, in learning a formal method. Uh, we'd like that effort to be as small as possible. So we'd like the method to be easy, easy to learn, 
Uh, we'd like it to be applicable to a whole variety of, uh, of systems and properties. And we'd like the knowledge and understanding that we gain to be transferable. So whatever we learn, we'd like it to, to, uh, to be transferable to, uh, to a variety of other, uh, of other methods. So, um, <coughs> so the, those are the considerations that have guided us in our choice of methods to show you in, uh, in, in this module. I'm just going to uh, pick up on the computer-based tool support uh, for a moment um, and emphasize a technique called model checking. So model checking is what has made formal methods uh, much more popular in industry over the last 10 years or so. Uh, because um, it allows us to reason about our specifications uh, without being mathematical geniuses. Um, it's uh, essentially a, a, a tool-supported technique for, for being able to establish that a model that you've built has some property that you've specified without necessarily going through a complicated proof process. The tool deals with the proof. So that satisfaction relationship that I talked about earlier on, the thing denoted by the turnstile, that satisfaction relationship is handled by the tool automatically. <laughs> so you can think of it as a pragmatic engineering approach uh, to the use of formal methods in, in system uh, design. And it, it supports all of the essential features of our, for, of our formal method. Uh, it will support our state transition-based models. It will support specifications written in first order and temporal logic. And we've got this press the button technique, this automatic technique to establish the satisfaction relationship. So if you think about how model checking might be applied to, to our embedded systems uh, view that we saw earlier on, this is, uh, this is the, the, the kind of approach that we've got. So we have a model of our controller. We have a model of the physical plant. Uh, both express the state transition system. We have a property specification typically expressed in some sort of, uh, of logic. These are the inputs to our model checker. And then our model checker churns away, and it pops out with a result. Uh, and the result that we get is either yes, or actually, in, in the case of, of uh, the model checker that you would use with, with TLA+, it says no errors. Uh, but if it's not the case that there are no errors, it doesn't just say there are errors. Um, it will give you a trace. So it's, you'll get a trace from the initial state of the system to the point at which the error occurs. Uh, and that's fantastically helpful when it comes to, to finding what's wrong with the model that you've built. Yeah, so you've, you've built your model, you've said, I think my model satisfies this property. You give this to your model checking tool, and if your model doesn't satisfy that property, you'll get a trace which shows you exactly why the, the, the property is invalidated. Uh, so that is much more helpful than trying to write a proof yourself, because very often when you're writing a proof, you get to a point in the proof, if, you, if you're trying to prove something which isn't true, eventually you get to a point in the proof where you're stuck. But you don't really know why you're stuck. Uh, whereas with this, uh, with this model checking approach, you get a trace which shows you exactly what the problem is. Uh, and that's a, that's a huge help. So model checking is the, is, is the key for, for, in fact, for all three techniques that we're going to look at. Uh, model checking is the key to making them, them, them really useful. Uh, so... Um, there are quite a lot of companies now using, using formal methods in their, in their uh, design and specification. So uh, Amazon, Microsoft, Intel, Google, Arm, and NASA are the... Are the, are the you know, if, if you were trying to form a list of where the, the, the most important software development is taking place, uh, these, these companies would be, would be on your list pretty, pretty, pretty well at the top. Um, 
I've put a link here to a talk given by David Langworthy. Uh, he's a, a, a systems engineer for Microsoft. Um, he uh, he's talking. Uh, his talk is from uh, from a conference earlier this year. I think it was July 2018 um, in uh, in Oxford. Uh, the uh, the formal methods Europe. Is it formal methods Europe? No. I can't remember if it was formal methods Europe or the federated, the federated uh, logic conference. It was one of the two. Anyway, so it, it's a, a massive uh, formal methods conference in, in Oxford in, uh, in, the, in the summer of this year. He was there talking about some examples of the use of TLA plus at Microsoft. It's a, the, the talk is about an hour long. He gets into some quite um, technical detail about some of the projects that it's being used on in the, in the middle section. Probably you, you don't want to look at that at this stage, but if you watch the first 10 minutes and, the, and, and, and maybe the last 10 minutes, so, so the first 10 minutes tells you why Microsoft were interested in applying TLA Plus uh, and how, uh, how important they think it is, and then the last 10 minutes tells you a little bit about what they've learned from, uh, from their uh, attempts to apply it. So it's worth having a look at that. Okay, I'm still doing my sales pitch at the moment to persuade you that this is a uh, this is uh, good stuff to be uh, good stuff to be learning. Um, we'll have a, 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 sh a short, uh, less technical interlude. So, can you name three winners of the Nobel Prize in Computer Science? Alan Turing. Alan Turing is is an excellent an excellent attempt. Okay. <laughs> so computer science is your subject. If I said name a Nobel Prize winner in physics, could you do it? Albert Einstein. That would that would be a good one, yeah. I'm surprised that, yeah, okay. Well, I, I was expecting somebody to, to tell me Einstein for physics. <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, there is no Nobel Prize for computer science. So, yeah, that was a, that was a bit of a, 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 a trick question. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so the equivalent award is the Turing Award. Yeah. So that was good, Matt, and yeah. So the uh, the Turing Award. Uh, so anybody who gets the Turing Award is you know, is 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 up in the, the upper echelons of their of their subject. They're, 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 they're the equivalent of a Nobel Prize winner for physics or chemistry or or physiology. Uh, it's been awarded annually since 1966, uh, and it currently comes with a prize of a million dollars. So if you're uh, yeah, if, if you're thinking um, computer science is going to be my route to riches, well, yeah, maybe it is. Uh, you just have to become a, a, a Turing Award winner. Uh, so let's have a look at some some past Turing Award winners. So here's uh, here's Amir Pnueli. Uh He won a Turing Award in 1996. Uh, and he won it for the introduction of, of temporal logic. Pnueli was the first person who thought of applying temporal logic to reasoning about computer programs. So he wrote this, uh, this paper, The Temporal Logic of Programs, uh, in 1977. Uh, and that established temporal logic as a, as a key element in being able to reason about... Can I have a late guess? Yeah. Is, is Judea Pearl? Very good. Did he get one? He did. Yeah. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Excellent. Right, so how have you heard of him? Uh, he was on a documentary. Um, it was the documentary was very popular. They always they, they brought up uh, the very tragic fate of his son, unfortunately. Oh, right. Um, because it was sort of a product of what he did, because it was done through the internet. Um, yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So Pnelli for temporal logic. Um, uh, Ed Clark, Alan Emerson, and Joe Sifakis were Turing Award winners in 2007 for their work on temporal logic, uh, sorry, on, on model checking. 
so, so Pnuali introduced temporal logic as, a, as an approach to reasoning about programs in 77, but he didn't know how to automate it. So if you, if you wrote some temporal logic and tried to reason about your program, you had to do it manually. You had to, you had to just be a good mathematician and, and write a formal proof manually. Uh, the, the, the key breakthrough was proposed by these guys. Actually, it was, it was done, uh, it was independent work. So Clark and Emerson uh, wrote a paper which was published in 81 uh, called The Design and Synthesis of Synchronization Skeletons Using Branching Time Temporal Logic. Uh, and uh, Sifakis, yeah, shame for, shame for poor old Kiel. Um, he, also, he also did the work on specification and verification of concurrent systems in Cesar. Uh, that was published in 82, but the, uh, the work was, was done independently. Uh, Sifakis, together with Clark and Emerson, uh, were given the award. For some reason, poor old Kiel was, uh, uh, was missed off. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of people who haven't won a Turing Award. Uh, they, they won the Gödel Prize in 2000 and the Paris Kanalekis Prize in 2005. That, that, those, are, that, those are both prestigious prizes, even though they're not, um, they're not uh, quite on the level of the Turing Award. So, uh, Moshe Vardy and Pierre Volta. Uh, they wrote uh, about the Autobata theoretic approach to automatic program verification. So, they've got a different approach to doing model checking from the approach that, uh, that uh, Clark, Emerson, and Sifakis have got. I think, this, I think this is the most beautiful piece of computer science, uh, and I'll give you a lecture on it later on in the, uh, later on in the module. Uh, and then finally, um, Leslie Lamport uh, won the Turing Award in 2013. Uh, he's been working uh, in this area for um, 30 years or more. Uh, he's the guy who's responsible for TLA+. Plus. Uh, he's written this book called Specifying Systems, the TLA Plus Language and Tools for Hardware and Software Engineers. Uh, you'll be using uh, this book uh, quite significantly for the first uh, few weeks uh, of, the, of the module. Even though he's been working on this for, for 30 years or so, it's only really since he, he, he became a Turing Award winner that uh, lots, of, uh, lots of companies have picked up on his approach and they're, they're busily applying it like, uh, like mad uh, these days. So uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Intel and ARM in particular are all beavering away applying TLA plus to modeling their systems. Uh, his primary contributions have been in the area of uh, distributed and concurrent systems. Uh, so he's, he's bang in the right area for us. So what point am I trying to make here? Uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is that the, the, the methods and techniques uh, that you'll be learning in the rest of this module uh, are right up there at the, at the pinnacle of computer science. Um, there have been, uh, well, there are, I've mentioned five Turing Award winners and, and two other people who have won other significant awards for the work that you'll be learning about in this module. All right, that's the end of the short interlude. We're going to get on to, to, to the bit that you'll love the best. Um, a recap of some basic maths. Okay, so uh, just, just so you know what's coming up, two, two hours is really too long. Um, you're, you're probably all fed up already. But um, what I normally do is, is rather than having a break in the middle, uh, I just I finish at 22. So, so typically you get a, in a, in a one hour slot, you'd have a 50 minute lecture. So in a, in a two hour slot, I give you 100 minutes and, and you finish at 22 and that gives you time to, to have a, a, a coffee before you turn up for distributed real-time systems and, uh, and listen to me going on about something else for another hour. Is that okay? If anybody doesn't like that approach, feel free to, 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 to say so or, or drop me an email or whatever. I, I, I can change it, but, but in previous years, typically that's, that's what people prefer to do. All right, so, um, so I said that our primary tools are going to be um, 
uh, logic and set theory. So let's let's quickly review some some logic. Uh, our starting point is with uh, propositional logic. So we, we want to know what a proposition is. Well, that's very simple. A proposition is just a statement that's either true or false. Uh, and we can use propositional variables to stand for um, uh, statements that are either true or false. So a propositional variable has a value which is, which is either true or false. They're used to represent propositions. So here are some examples of propositions. Um, it rained in Newcastle on the 2nd of October 2018. Well, I haven't noticed any rain yet, so, so currently that's, that, that looks as though it's false. Uh, Mike Ashley is an excellent football club chairman. Well, that's either true or false, depending on your, on your point of view. Some, some programming related propositions. So n is less than or equal to 1. Well, that's either true or false, depending on what, what state your program is in. in. Uh, the length of the buffer is equal to the max buffer size. Again, that's either true or false, depending on what state your, your, your program is in. So uh, our propositional variables could be used to, to represent these propositions. So maybe rain would be a propositional variable representing this one, and Ashley a variable representing this one, P might represent this, Q might represent this, and so on. Um, the kinds of things that we can say in English that are not propositions are commands like pass the salt. Uh, or questions like, will Newcastle United win a Premier League match in the 2018-19 season? So these are examples of things that are propositions, but if we, if we make a statement which is, uh, which is either true or false, that's a proposition. Um, so this, this table looks horrible, but actually it's, it's trivial. Uh, we can build uh, compound propositions from, from simpler propositions uh, by uh, using logical operators to, uh, to join them together. So if we've got propositional variables P and Q, well, we can, uh, we can say not uh, P, uh, for example. Um, in TLA+, plus, not is going to be written like this, this little tilde symbol. Um, so if P is false, then uh, not P is true. And if P is true, uh, then not P is false. Uh, we've got or, so again, if P and Q are propositional variables, we can join them to, to, together with a, an or. And the table just tells us what the, what the possibilities are. Yeah, so here we've got false, false for P and Q, and in that case, P or Q is false. In every other combination of values for P and Q, uh, P or uh, Q is true, and so on. So it's, it's, like, it's like your, it, well, it's actually much simpler than your multiplication table. It's just a way of, of looking up what the value of a compound proposition is, is going to be based on the value of, of its component parts. Uh, the only operator which I have ever seen students have a, a problem with is the, uh, is the implies operator. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the row in the, uh, in the truth table which, um, which causes the confusion is the row where the thing on the left hand side is false uh, actually, it's, it's both rows. It's, 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 it's these two rows where the thing on the left-hand side is false. Um, if P is false, then P implies anything is true. Um, that's like saying you can prove anything from a false premise. So if you, assume, if you assume something that's wrong, you can prove whatever you like. Um, it's just that you're, um, you're going to eventually come unstuck. So this is, this is the, the column that you, that you need to learn. 
uh, because probably your intuition will lead you into, into error. So if uh, the, these other ones, the, the, the not, the or, and the and, uh, I, I, I suspect, and, and, and even the, uh, the equivalents, the if and only if one at the end uh, here, uh, I don't think you have any, uh, any problems with those. But if you're, if, if you're going to go away and learn any particular column, then, then learn that one. Um, and throughout your time uh, working on this module, uh, this is the one that will cause you the most problems. Um, so, so try to avoid that by making sure that you're, you're familiar with that, with that column. Um, a, a couple of bits of terminology. A tautology is a proposition that's true for all possible valuations of its variables. Um, and a contradiction is a proposition that's false for all possible valuations of its variables. Uh, the exercises uh, in the labs uh, later on in the week will, will give you some uh, practice with, uh, with looking at that. Um, so that was it for, for logic. Um, I don't want to do any more. Well, no, not quite. No, that, that's, that, that was the propositional logic. I'm going to say something about about predicate logic in a minute. But we'll have a look at sets first because that, that helps with the explanation of, of predicate logic. So set theory is the foundation of ordinary mathematics. Um, from the times of, of uh, the early 20th century when people like Frege and Russell and Whitehead were trying to put basic mathematics on a fully formal uh, foundation. Um, people have been using set theory to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, so for example, um, yeah, even complicated ideas like the Riemann integral or, or, or the, uh, the, uh, the, the first order derivative, you can base all of that stuff, you can build it up from, from basic set theory. Um, we're going to regard the, uh, the idea of a set and this, this operator, which we'll, we'll call them the, the membership operator, uh, as primitive notions. We're not going to try and define them uh, any further. Um, if, we, if we've got some set S, uh, if, we, uh, if, it, if it's true that X is a member of S, then and we can say that X is an element of S, or, or X is a member of S, or more briefly, X is in S. So, so all of those things uh, are bits of uh, English language that we'll use to, uh, to talk about this relationship between some, some uh, entity and some, and some set. Uh, a set can have a finite or infinite number of, uh, of elements, so the set of natural numbers. Uh, 0, 1, 2, and so on is infinite. Uh, the set of natural numbers less than 3 is finite, and we can write it like this. So we use these curly, curly brackets to represent our sets. Uh, and a set is completely determined by its elements. So two sets are, are, are equal if they have the same elements. So 0, 1, 2 is the same as 2, 1, 0. So notice here, order is not significant. When we write our set down, it doesn't matter what, what order we write the, the, uh, the elements in. Uh, that's going to represent the same set if the, if the elements are the same. And also duplicates don't make any difference. So we, if we write our set down like this, it would be a little bit misleading, but we could do it. But it still represents exactly the same set as this one. So ordering and duplicates don't change the, uh, the, the set. So if our set S is defined as the set 0, 1, 2, then 1 <coughs> is a member of S uh, is a true proposition, and 3 not a member of S. Notice this, this line through the membership operator just means not a member of, uh, is also a true proposition. Uh, and then we've got these basic set operators. So intersection. Uh, so if we've got two sets S and T, then the intersection of S and T is just the set of elements that are both in S and also in T. So if we've got a set here, one minus uh, a half and three, 
and we take its intersection with 1, 2, 3, 5, and 7. Well, the only elements which are in both sets are 1 um, and 3. Uh, so those are the elements in the intersection. Uh, the elements in the, uh, in the union of S and T, union is written like this, um, if we've got these two sets, then the union has got all of the elements in, uh, in this set, <coughs> plus all of the elements in that set. Uh, set difference is written like this, with this backslash operator. So S uh, uh, minus T is the, uh, the set of elements in S uh, that are not also in T. So here, uh, 1 is in S, but it's also in T, so it's missing from the result. Uh, minus a half is in S, but it's not in T, so it's present in the result. Uh, 3 is in S, but it's not in T, so it's also present in the result. So those are our basic ways of constructing uh, sets. We've got a subset <coughs> operator. So S is a subset of T is true if every element of S is also an element of T. So here, uh, 1, 3. 1 is in S. It's also in T. 3 is in S, it's also in T. So 1, 3 is a subset of, of, of 3, 2, 1. I know, I know this is all basic stuff, but I just want to, just in case you've, you've completely forgotten this, I just want to make sure I've been through it with you. Um, if we've got a set S, then the set of all subsets of S, it's written in TLA plus using this, this word subset. So subset of S means all possible subsets of S. So if S is the set 1, 2, 3, then subset of S is the set which contains these, these sets. And notice that every one of these sets is a subset of our original set S. And those are all, all of the possible subsets. There are, there are no missing subsets here. Um, Mathematicians normally call this uh, subset S the power set of S, and they would normally write it like this using this calligraphic P symbol. So P of S is the power set of S. That's exactly what TLA plus means by subset S. Sometimes you might see a mathematician write it as 2 to the S. Uh, that also means the, uh, the, the set of all possible subsets of the set. Uh, if we've got a set of sets, then the union of uh, that is the union of all of the elements in S. So here, here is a set. Each element in the set is itself a set. And the union of those is just the union of all the sets in the set. So it's 1, 2, union 2, 3, union 3, 4, which is just the set 1, 2, 3, 4. Again, uh, mathematicians would normally write union S like this, with this big cup symbol uh, of S. So occasionally you'll see it written like that. But, but for our specs in, in TLA plus, we'll write it as union S. Is this OK? Yeah, is, any, is anybody totally bewildered by this, or are you all happy? OK. Um, Cardinality, so for any finite set S, uh, the total number of, uh, of elements in S is known as its cardinality. So, um, yeah, cardinality is just a, fanc a fancy word for the number of elements in the set. Uh, normally a mathematician would write cardinality like this, using these, these vertical bar symbols around <coughs> the set. There's something which is it's worth noting. Um, the cardinality of the power set of, of, of S is just the number 2 raised to the cardinality of S. Okay, so we looked at, um, we looked at a set earlier on, the set 1, 2, 3. It's got three elements. We also looked at the, 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 the subsets of 1, 2, 3. That set had eight elements. Uh, so. Uh, the, the cardinality of the original set was 3, 
uh, the cardinality of the power set is 8, which is just 2 to the power 3. All I'm doing is pointing out that that is always true. So, um, if, if you're trying to check whether or not you've looked at all of the, the elements in a, in, a, in a power set, one possible check you can do is to figure out how many elements you expected there to be, which you can do using this relationship here, and then check that you've got that el many elements in your, in your power set. Um, TLA plus gives you the cardinality uh, operator as a uh, as an operator from its finite sets module, so and it, and it writes it as cardinality. <clears throat> um, other ways of constructing sets. Um, Imagine that we've got a set S with just the numbers 1 to 8 in it. We can construct a new set using this notation. So it's the, ele it's the elements X in S that satisfy some predicate P. So that set is going to contain just the elements in, in the set mentioned here, but they need to satisfy the predicate P. So here's an example. So the set of n in S such that um, n modulo 2 is 0 uh, is just the set of even numbers in S. Yeah, so here's our set S, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If we consider each element in turn uh, and say, is n modulo 2 equal to 0 true? If it is, that element goes into our set. Uh, if it's not, then it doesn't. So uh, 1 modulo 2 equals 1, so it's not in the set. 2 modulo 2 is 0, so it is. 3 modulo 2 is 1, so it's not, and so on. So we get the, uh, we get the even numbers. Um, a related notation is this one. So this is all possible expressions of the form E, uh, where E probably involves the, uh, the variable X where x is taken from the set s. So again, here's an example. So 2 to the f, two, 2 times n, where n is in s, is going to give us um, all of these elements, but multiplied by 2. So 1 gives us 2, 2 gives us 4, 3 gives us 6, and so on. So every element in, in, in the set form like this is of this form. It's 2 times n, where n is drawn from the original set s. Yeah? These are, are be, these these notations are becoming much more common in, in programming languages as well. So you might already be familiar with these from if, if you've done any work with Python. Uh, Python has both it, it calls them comprehensions. So Python has both set comprehensions and list comprehensions with both of these forms. The syntax is slightly different. The TLA plus syntax is simpler. The Python syntax is a, is, 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 is a little bit more complicated, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. Yeah? So these are just ways of, of forming sets. There's a TLA plus defines an operator, dot dot, which kind of formalizes the, uh, the, the sort of notation that I was using earlier on with, with, with some dots to suggest a range. So dot dot is defined on the set uh, int of, of, of integers. Uh, and it's defined like this. So m dot dot n, where m is some integer and n is some integer, is just uh, the values in the set of integers such that m is less than or equal uh, to the value v, uh, and also v is less than or equal to the, to the value n. So it's just all <coughs> of the integers from n to n. Um, one of the benefits of uh, making this definition formal is that immediately, I say immediately, I'm optimistic, but immediately you know what the, what the resulting set is going to be if, uh, if m is greater than n. Imagine, imagine m is 7 and n is 5. What is the resulting set?
Sorry? The null set. The null set, yes. So just it's it's just the empty set because there is no V in the set of integers such that um, some some number M which is bigger than uh, N satisfies both of these uh, both of these properties. So uh, so the, the result is just the uh, the empty set. <coughs> Okay, predicate logic. Um, predicate logic essentially gives you two additional operators uh, over propositional logic. So, so you've seen ands and ors and nots and implies and equivalents. Uh, predicate logic gives us two more operators uh, and they're called quantifiers. So it gives us this universal quantifier, uh, which uh, in maths is written as this upside down A. In uh, TLA plus, you'll type it as backslash uh, uppercase A. Um, and it allows us to say things like this. For all x in some set S, it's the case that P of x is true. Um, and essentially what that gives us is the conjunction of formulas for all x in S. So here's an example. Imagine that our set S is 1, 2, 3. Uh, if we say for all n in 1, 2, 3, it's the case that n squared is greater than n, yeah, then that's the um, uh, equivalent to this set of conjunctions. So it's, it's equivalent to 1 squared is greater than 1, and 2 squared is greater than 2, and 3 squared is greater than 3. And then we evaluate this to, uh, to, to find out if the, if the whole thing is true or not. Uh, whereas the existential quantifier, which again in maths is written as a, as a backwards E, uh, is, uh, is related to the OR operator. So if we say there exists an X in the set S such that P of X, that's just the disjunction of, uh, of all formulas uh, P of X. So here, if we say there exists an N in the set 1, 2, 3 such that N squared is greater than N, then that's equivalent to uh, 1 squared is greater than 1, or 2 squared is greater than 2, or 3 squared is greater than 3. Yeah. Uh, in TLA plus, we type the, uh, the existential quantifier as, as a backslash E. Um, there are a couple of uh, important tautologies here. Uh, if we say not for all x in s, it's the case that p of x, uh, then that's equivalent to saying there's some x in s uh, such that not p of x. Yeah? Uh, in other words, if everything in your set doesn't satisfy some property, then uh, there is some element in that set that, that doesn't satisfy that property. And similarly here, uh, if we say uh, it's not the case that there's some x in s such that p of x, then it means for all x uh, in s, not p of x is true. Um, TLA plus gives us some abbreviations. So if we say for all x in s, comma y in t, it's the case that P of XY, uh, that's just an abbreviation for for all X in S, it's the case that for all Y in T, P of XY. Uh, and you can take that to, uh, to uh, whatever extent you like. So you can, uh, you, you can also say there exists X, Y, and Z in S, such that P of X, Y, Z. And again, that's just an abbreviation <coughs> for this. There exists X in S, such that there exists Y in S, such that there exists Z in S, such that P of X, Y, Z. Okay, and then I'll just mention this briefly. This is just a, this is this is specific to TLA plus uh, <coughs> syntax. If we say some operator foo is defined as for all x in x, it's the case that p, and for all x in t, it's the case that q. Then 
if you don't put the brackets in explicitly, TLA plus will, will parse that in a, in a rather surprising way. It will, it will assume that, that this extends right to the end of the line, and it will put the brackets in like this. Um, and that's, that's usually not what you want. So the way to solve that is to put the brackets where it, in explicitly. So you could say for all x in x, it's the case of p, and for all x in t, it's the case of q. So put the brackets in explicitly and have the conjunction. Or well, one of the things that we're going to find is that um, we've got this really useful kind of bulleted list notation where we can uh, write our uh, conjunctions and disjunctions as bulleted lists and the indentation becomes significant. I'll say a little bit more about that in the, uh, in the lab session on, on, on Friday. So if we wrote foo like this, this makes it even clearer. It's, uh, it's defined foo to be the conjunction of for all x in s it's the case that p and for all x in t it's the case that q, which is essentially equivalent to this, but you find eventually that's, uh, that becomes uh, a lot easier to read. All right, um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, I didn't get as far as I wanted to. That's not, that's not a surprise, unfortunately. Uh, I think what I'll do is, because the lab session on Friday depends on you having seen this, uh, this uh, TLA plus specification, I'll introduce that spec at the beginning of Friday's lab. We've got a couple of hours in the lab on Friday. I'll probably spend half an hour introducing that, uh, that first TLA plus spec at the beginning of the lab. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much.